so hello everyone welcome to the last tcs plus talk of the semester uh, we are extremely excited to have ronit uh, ruben field here to give a test of time talk today uh, test of time talks were started this semester and this is our second such talk uh, technical portion of the talk would be around 45 minutes long and then there would be 15 minutes for questions and the question pass questions part won't be recorded so that we can have a more open discussion and for questions during the talk uh, people on zoom can raise hands or type them in the chat and i can communicate them to ronit uh, so coming back to today's talk uh, ronit is a edwin sibley webster professor of eecs at mit uh, she has seminal works in many many areas of tcs uh, especially in property testing and sublinear time algorithms and uh, today we will hear about history of sublinear time algorithms and more uh, to you on it okay thank you um so i want to dedicate this talk to the young researchers and also to the old ones <laughs> um and i think hopefully everybody will get something out of this okay so i mean i just want to have a disclaimer there's going to be lots of stories um they're not exactly true <laughs> And they're not exactly complete, and they're not exactly chronological, but um, but they are stories. And it's it is the way I remember things, but I know it's not exactly right. Okay, so let me just give you some context. Um, and the context has become super funny in the last. I mean, I gave this talk three years ago and two years ago, and now the context is going to look totally different than when I previous gave previously gave this context. But back in 1987. When I was a second year grad student, a third year grad student, this was the end of the Cold War, which we may refer to later as the end of the first Cold War. But, the, <laughs> but, it, but that was what we called the end of the Cold War. And, you know, we were making overtures to be friendly with the Russians, and we were learning all sorts of important Russian words like borscht. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce that, but we were learning it. <laughs> that's a drinking, that's a drinking toast. <laughs> um, and we were learning important political Russian words like Vasnost and Perestroika. And there was this one, uh, there was this one saying in Russian that we were learning, which was Dovarai no Provarai. And why were we learning that? Even Ronald Reagan knew this one. And it's because I knew you would show up. <laughs> okay, why did we learn Dovarai no Provarai? Even Ronald Reagan could say this because it was a very important uh, saying back then. Um, in particular, it was the philosophy behind the intermediate. Can I interrupt? Yeah, so the sound is a bit echoey. Can we do something? Um, is it is is it okay now? Uh, I think so. Both my so maybe we can just turn off the. You're just saying take off one of the mics. Audience mic okay. and uh, for your mic also there is some echo. Maybe we can reduce the volume or something. So maybe we, um okay I don't know how to do that. We just lost our support. Should we um. Can we take this off? I don't know. Oh, but uh, I think uh, you're, yeah. Uh, or maybe we should only keep this one and I should take mine off. Let's try no, just take it. No, I think we want your mic, but not okay. the audience. So this one we take off. We don't know how to do that. Okay, is it better now? Yeah, uh, and maybe okay. can you put your mic a bit lower? Maybe that will help. Um, this is the mic. I don't know how to change it. Um, that is something that requires um, going into that box, and I don't know how to do that. So, <laughs> um, no, okay, sorry. we're working on it. Okay. But I think she just means. I mean, you mean, you mean physically lower? Yes. On your body. Yes. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Let's. Maybe that's okay. All right. So, so okay. So let us know if there's a problem now. Back to 1987. Why you okay? Let's go back to this. Was the saying that we were interested in? I don't know if you're seeing. Um, I think on Zoom you're not seeing unless I do this. Uh, this is the saying we were interested in. Dovarai no provarai, and everybody knew what that meant. It meant trust but check. And the reason it was so important is it was the philosophical basis behind the INF treaty. Um, with uh, Gorbachev and Reagan signed this treaty that we're all going to get rid of our mid-range nuclear forces, uh, nuclear warheads, 
Um, but you don't want to get rid of your warheads if the other team isn't getting rid of theirs, but you want to sound like you're trusting. So what do you do? Okay, I trust you, but I have to, I get to check. Okay. Um, by the way, this uh, treaty is no longer um, because we trusted, we checked, we found out that it, they weren't holding it, and we <laughs> stopped the treaty. <laughs> the treaty is totally stopped because we checked, and they checked, uh, everybody checked. Okay. <laughs> This is 1987 now. Okay, so that was 1987. 1988, I'm in like the middle of my PhD career in Berkeley. And, you know, I had a couple of small papers. Nobody was interested in them. It was like, what, what am I doing here? And it was just really not clear where this whole thing is going. Um, and in, in addition, these were the other PhD students at Berkeley. And, you know, I'm just going to let you sit there and take that list in for a second. <laughs> okay, so those were my fellow students. Um, and there were more. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing people there. Um, Eddie, so the, Grove. Eddie Grove, that's right. Eddie Grove was there. And uh, there were lots of amazing, amazing people. And it, this is like half of them. A, and kind of, it was really sort of wow. Um, so, you know, I'm not really getting anywhere. Everybody else is doing amazing things. Maybe I need a plan B. So law, law school, maybe, or maybe I should go get an MBA. Um, or, you know, and I thought these were good plan Bs. Actually, what I know now is some of those plan Bs weren't so good because my friends that did those plan Bs, they're really unhappy. <laughs> they're really unhappy now. <laughs> but, you know, it was important to have a plan B just to keep myself going, that there's always something I could do if I got stuck, if I got stuck even though the plan B was terrible. Um, a, and, you know, at some point I even got a leaflet from the Marine Corps, and I thought, well, you know, at least somebody will take me. <laughs> And I thought, okay, so there's something, something I can do. And um, but luckily, Manuel said, why don't why don't you just work on program checking? I'm like, okay, what's program checking? Okay, so what's program checking? Program checking was this new model um, that was in, proposed in order to try to understand if your program is making an error. Okay, and again, this notion of trust the program but check. Okay, well. The point is you can use the program to help you check. So this is not a programming logics approach. Nobody was looking into the program at all. We view the program as a black box, um, but somehow you can use the program to actually help you check the answers. And the idea is you can call the program on other inputs. And so the program is then behaving as a prover in the interactive proof system model, which was just being beginning to be studied at that time. So this, you know, it was in, in the early 80s, mid 80s, we were just beginning to understand that this interactive proof thing was a really cool thing, but it, you know, we were not yet at the point where we understood that IP equals P space and all that stuff. So we were just, we knew it was exciting, but we didn't know where it's gonna go. All right, so Blum proposed this program checking model, given a program P that's claiming to compute a function F and a specific input X. Well, you'd like to check the program on this input. Now, if the program is completely correct on every single input, then this checker better in output pass. It better not like invent bugs that are not in this program. On the other hand, if the program is wrong, in particular on this input X, then the checker should output fail. Okay, what about in the middle? Maybe the program is correct on input X, but wrong on lots of other inputs. And you can't, you know, you can't use this program to help you just know it's wrong. In the, and one, one example to think about is, what if you have a primality testing program that just tells you that everything's prime? You know this thing is wrong. <laughs> okay, so it's always saying prime. So when you call it on 17, it's also gonna say prime, but is it right, is it wrong? I have no idea. So in that in-between case where it's not correct on all inputs, but it may be correct on X, then either answer is okay. Okay, because you um, maybe, when you're trying to check whether it's correct on X, you call it on other inputs and it helps you understand that actually the program really is correct on X. And then it's okay to output that it's correct on X. Or maybe when you do the checks, you see some inconsistency in the programs and you're like, I can't use this, it's not helpful. So I'm checking the program. And then the claim is either way science advances. You either know this program's bad and you check it, or you know the program was right on this particular input X, and now you can use that result. So, you either, so in either case, there's a win. Okay, now the problem is, how do you check the checker? Because why should you trust this checker? Maybe you have a primality program and you run it and it gives you an answer. And now 
your checker might be another primality program, maybe even the same primality program, and you run it and it gives the same answer. So, but maybe it's the same program. So what do you gain out of running the same program twice? Nothing, right? So that is not a good idea. So we'd like somehow the checker to be different than the program. But how do you quantify different? We're not very good at that. Um, we're not good at quantifying different. We're not good at quantifying simpler. But what we can do, we're complexity theorists, is we can specify that the runtime of the checker should be little o of the runtime of the best program for the function. And that's what Blumkanan did, okay? And people went ballistic, okay? <laughs> Why? Because that's a crazy definition. What do you mean? I mean, what if you get a better best algorithm? Then your checker could go out of style and then it's not gonna be a checker anymore. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> that's what's gonna happen. In fact, and the reason is at the time we didn't talk about fine grained complexity. So I think now people wouldn't, freak out as much, but um, back then people really went nuts and thought this was a stupid definition. Okay, so while I agree that uh, mathematically that is a definition where a checker can go out of style and uh, maybe you can't actually prove that this checker will always be good because we have no lower bounds that are super linear. Um, on the other hand, if you look empirically at the checkers that were developed in this model, I think that you would agree or maybe you wouldn't, but I would agree that a, they're simpler and they're doing something different than actually computing the function. Okay, so it's one of those cases where if you look at the value of this definition, just look at the results and um, it did get different ideas. It forced people to think in a different way. And because of that, a, we did get different kinds of checkers. So I think it turned out to be a great idea. Okay. And some of the examples from the original blum Kanan paper are, okay, we can check sorting. Right, because I have an input and an output. So what do I have to check? I have to check that the output is in sorted order and that the input and output have any relationship to each other, like they should be the same elements. So I have to do some sort of multi-set equality test and there's a randomized algorithm for that. So that's not a problem. Um, there was an, something for extended GCD. That's where you get not just the GCD, but the two, um, the two, but anyway, never mind what it is. I'll talk about GCD later. Okay, and there were a bunch of examples of checkers via interactive proofs. So I think most of you in this room can imagine what the checker for graph isomorphism might have looked like. It was just using the standard interactive proof. Um, there were also checkers for group theory, um, all sorts of group theory problems, which were really cool. And then there was this one for matrix rank. And what was cool is it was an interactive proof type checker for matrix rank, but matrix rank was a problem in P. And at that time, we did not ever consider interactive proofs for problems in P. So in some sense, this checking world was actually focusing on interactive proofs for problems in P. Okay, and I thought it was really cool. And it was like very motivating for me. So I'm gonna make you sit through an explanation of how that checker worked. Okay, so um, here's what they said. They said, given an N by N matrix A, the program now claims that the rank is R. Okay, so what does the checker kind of do? It's going to use the program to find an R by R submatrix B that's supposedly a full rank, assuming the checker isn't actually cheating, the program isn't cheating. How are you going to do that? You're just going to repeatedly eliminate rows and columns and ask the program, is the rank still R? Like I'll ask about a column. If I remove it, is the rank still R? And the program says yes, so keep it removed. If it says no, the rank is not still R, put it back in. Okay, that's the whole thing. Um, so now you get down to B, it should, I mean, once you do this for every row and column, you should get down to an R by R matrix. Um, if you don't, then the rank is not R, <laughs> okay? So um, you can kill the program and say, that's a bad program. But if it is really R by R, um, then we need to check that this B really is of rank R. That this, I wanna check that A is of rank at least R, so I wanna check that this sub matrix B has full rank. Okay, and then I want to check that the rank of A is at most R. So I'm going to check that B is a full rank on the next slide. And I'm going to just tell you that the ideas behind checking that the rank of A is at most R is the same kind of idea. Um, and so I'm not going to describe that. All right, so I'm just going to do this thing. I'm using my mouse because um, for the people on Zoom. Okay, maybe I'm not using my mouse. I thought I could. I don't have a mouse. Do you see if I do this? Nope. Okay, all right, so, so basically next slide. I think I'm mouseless now. Hi. Okay, so too bad. <laughs> okay, all right, so let's test that matrix B is 
full rank. Um, so I have this R by R matrix B. And what are we going to do to test that it's full rank is we're going to pick for each row J, I'm going to see if J is linearly independent of the other rows. Yes. Did anybody work up one Not in these works. Uh -huh. Not in these works. And pretty much no. But um, but there are some works that thought about approximations like that you would get by cutting off bits. So, but I'm not going to talk about it today, but there is a little bit okay. on that. Um, definitely not in this rank. <laughs> okay. Um, a, so, for each row J, we're going to test if it's linearly independent of the other rows. We're going to pick a random 0, 1 vector C, and I'm going to create a vector Y which is a random linear combination of all the rows, okay? And I'm gonna replace the jth row by y. Okay, so, so just take out the jth row, but put in this random linear combination. And now ask the program what the rank of the new b is, this new b. Now, if the rank of b really was r, then the rank of the new b should be, well, it should be r if the jth, if c sub j was equal to one, if you if when you took the random linear combination of the rows, you actually put the j row into the random linear combination. And if c sub j is zero, you had left out the j row from the random linear um, combination. And if cj really was independent of everything else, then these things should now be rank r minus one. Okay, so, but the problem is if j wasn't really independent of the other rows, then the new B distribution should be indistinguishable in the two cases, okay? And somehow the prover needs to distinguish the case where um, it needs to be able to distinguish whether CJ was one or zero. And it can only do that if the rank was R, okay? So, it, so it's only in this case here, can we tell the difference? Um, in this case, there is no difference in the in the distribution. Okay, so that's why the program, if the program can always tell us whether the rank is r or r minus one, then we know that he can figure out what our CJ was, and the only way he can do that is if the rank really was r. Okay, so that's the idea of blum -Kanat. So I thought that was super cool. Okay, and that was like the first time I saw an interactive proof for a problem in P. But then. Soon after, there was a new interactive proof for Apollo and P for GCD. I'm going to give you the high level idea of this one too, because it was really, really inspiring to me. Um, this is by Edelman, Huang, and Compella. And here, you assume the program says the GCD of A and B is one, um, but let's say it really is G. Okay, so let's take the case where the GCD is claimed to be one by the program, but it's really bigger. Okay, and let's assume because you can just divide A and B by all small A, you can divide A and B by all small numbers, you can assume that G is a lot bigger than one, just a constant, but a constant that's a lot bigger than one, okay? All right, so what does the checker do? This is a little weird, okay? It's gonna pick random numbers, Y1, Y2, Y3, and we're gonna use the fact that because G is sort of big, usually Y1, Y2, and Y3 are not actually multiples of G. And then we're gonna pick random multiples of G, as follows, we're going to pick these random numbers R1, R2, R3, and we're going to set Xi to be Ri times A mod B times 2 to the J. Why that? Because look, if GCD of A and B is actually G, which is bigger than 1, then this Xi is also going to be divisible by G. Okay? Is that clear? All right. It's not going to, um, it's not going to be too much bigger than B. It's going to be at most b times two to the j but it's um but it's so it's going to be in some reasonable range here all right and in the good case which happens often enough the yi's and the ri's and the g's are all relatively prime so that's the good case and when we're in the good case i'm going to claim that we're going to be able to fool the prover i mean if the prover tried to lie to us about g then we're going to be able to fool the prover and we're going to catch him and essentially the idea is like this you're going to flip a coin and with heads probability you're going to ask the program What's the GCD of X1, Y3 and X2, Y3? And there, if the, you know, we're, you know, we're supposing we're in the good case where the XI should be relatively prime. Um, and we know about Y3 because we, we stuck it in there. Now, the prover doesn't know how we got this. We don't tell him X1, Y3. We tell him X1 times Y3 and X2 times Y3. 
So in this case, though, when everything's good, you expect to see y3 is the GCD, but the real answer would be g times y3. So the program has to cheat in this case. Okay, the reason, because if, if the, um, notice that the xi's are random multiples of g. Okay, now the program was claiming that g is equal to one, but it's not. So the real answer here is supposed to be g times y3, and the program has to realize that and divide the answer by g and tell you y3. Okay, but if you do tails, you're gonna ask the program, what's the GCD of x3 times y1 and x3 times y2? Now, in this case, when everything's good and everything was it, um, relatively prime the way you want, well, you expect to see x3, and the real answer is x3 because y1 and y2 were um, relatively prime. Okay, so here the program has to tell you the truth. Now the problem is the program can't really tell the difference between those types types of questions. The reason is they both look like two independently chosen random number times g times a random number, and so the program really can't tell the difference. And in one case he has to cheat, the other case he has to tell the truth. How are you going to tell? Okay, so I just I love this. Okay, I was so excited about this. I'm like, I want to do something like that. Okay, and I was like, this is what I want to do, um, but. <laughs> for what? I mean, it seems, you know, it always seems like, okay, everybody's already done all the cool problems, there's nothing left. So I'm like, what's left? What else is there that I can do? Um, and then I thought, well, at the time, you know, everybody was talking, now nobody talks about PRAM, but back then PRAM was the thing. So what about parallel programs? Everybody, it was really considered in style and cool. And partly I'm telling you this so you realize the styles in the world. <laughs> and um, those were styles back then. So if there's a notion of parallel checkers, you know, me and my office mate, um, um, Sampath Kanan, we were both sort of independently came up with this idea of let's look at parallel checkers. And we both kind of defined it in the same way, just the normal definition of checkers, but now for the little low property to make sure the checker is different than computing the function, how would we enforce this? We'd ask that the parallel depth of the checker be little o of the depth of the best program for f. And now what's nice about parallel is we actually have a lower bound in parallel. Like we know that a lot of things can't be done in constant depth. So if you can get a constant depth checker, then you know you can actually prove that this is a this is going to be a checker that isn't just in style today and might go, blow away tomorrow, but it's actually always going to be a good checker. You know, and one other example would be if you're looking for a checker for a p-complete problem and you find a checker that runs in polylog time, then you know, unless somebody actually shows that p equals nc, then you're still going to be in business for a while. So that's um, why parallel checker was sort of a, seemed like a good idea. Okay, so there were really lots of parallel checkers, all pairs shortest path, max matching, sorting, planar convex hull, anything you can solve with dynamic programming, symmetric functions, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and one problem I, in particular I want to talk about is multiplication. I'm going to talk about all kinds of multiplication, but this would hold for matrix multiplication, modular multiplication, and uh, integer multiplication. Uh, um, and maybe at some point, floating point multiplication. <laughs> That's for Martin. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure Martin feels like somebody's remembering him. <laughs> okay. All right. So here's just a stupid way to do checker for multiplication. Think of B soup I. Okay, I'm multiplying A times B. And for now, let's think of them as in binary representation of integers. And B sub I would be the lowest significant I bits of B. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out A times B. So I want A times B sub N because I want all bits of B. But what we're gonna do is call the program on every B sub I. We can do this in parallel. Okay, so here we've called the program on b sub one and on b sub two and on b sub three and um, b sub i and b sub i minus one and b sub i and up to b. Okay, so we're going to do in parallel call the program on all these um, suffixes of b. Okay, now you can easily check that the first one is correct because it's just multiplying by a, a zero one bit. That's easy to check, right? And the other thing you can do is you can check that these differences are correct. In, very quickly in parallel time, because the differences should be zero if B sub I is a zero, and it should be exactly A times two to the I minus one if B sub I is one, okay? So I can take the program, I can check that the program's value at A times B sub I is equal to A times B sub I minus one plus A times two to the I minus one. This multiplication is just a shift. So I don't need fancy multiplication to do that. And then I can just add, and we can add an AC0. 
Okay, so we can do all of these consistency checks at the same time in constant depth. All right, but that is um, lots of processors. And even these days, my colleagues would complain about squaring the number of processors. But even back then, that was a uh, considered a problem. Okay, so then the question is, can we do better? All right, so to answer this, let me talk about self-testing correcting. So I think we're finally getting to the point. <laughs> but it's a, this is, um, and the idea here, this is why, this is really why we looked at this problem. Um, we noticed that like, if you're given a program that's correct on most inputs, you can fix it. Okay. So this is really self-correcting is no more than random self-reducibility, but for problems in P. And actually Dick Lipton at the same time independently uh, came up with the same idea. But very confusingly, he called it self-testing, and we used a different notion for self-testing. So if you look at the, um, I'm just going to use a stick to the BLR terminology if you um, let me. Okay, so um, here you're given a program that's correct on most inputs, and you want to fix it. So what are you going to do? Um, let's again assume we're talking about multiplication by some constant B, and think of B as a big number. We're given an input X. We're supposed to be outputting X times B. The program, we only know is right on most x's. We don't know that it's right on every x. So what do we do? Well, if we call it on x, um, it may not be right. So we're going to call it on two random inputs that differ by x. We're going to pick random y. We're gonna, and we're going to call p on y and x plus y. And what we're going to output is p of x plus y minus p of y. And that should be the correct answer if we're lucky and p is correct both on x plus y and on y. So let's assume that p is incorrect on at most one eighth of the inputs. Then it's incorrect on p of y by with probability at most one eighth, and incorrect on p of x plus y with probability at most one eighth. And then by union bound, it's correct on both with probability probability at least three quarters. Okay. And so and if it's correct on both, I get the right answer. Okay. So that's self-correcting. That's what you do if you know your program is correct on most inputs. Okay, and now you have turned it into a program that is correct on every input with high probability. So you would just repeat this several times and take the most common answer. Um, if you ever see a problem, if you ever see a different answer throughout the program, but you would just repeat this several times, take the most, take um, the answer that you see all the time. And um, now you have a program that's correct on every single input. Okay, now I just want to point out that in 1994, there was this really famous Pentium bug. Um, and it was an error floating point division, and you actually could fix this with self-correctors, but, um, you know, if you wanted to, while you were getting a new um, Pentium, probably, because it would slow you down, okay? And the reason the Pentium bug was so good is they were getting everything so perfectly uh, optimized that, um, that they probably wouldn't, in general, want a two-time slowdown, but in the meantime, while you're getting your new chip, or while you're ordering your new chip, and you know these days ordering chips takes a while, mm -hmm. um, you could use self-correctors. Okay. All right. Now, how do you know that P is correct on most inputs? Well, we'd use self-testing. What is that? Again, we want to pass good programs. We want to fail programs that are wrong on a large enough fraction of the inputs. And we want to do something other than computing the function in order to test it, so we want this little low property. How would you construct that? One thing you can do is you can use a checker. You could pick a random input, use the checker on the input. That's something you can do. What else can you do? So I'm gonna propose, um, so I'm, I'm, now I'm doing things chronologically. So this was the next idea after the one, um, is to come up with a self-tester for random self-reducible and download self-reducible functions, okay? So we just saw that if your, if your function is random self-reducible or has a self-corrector, and you have a program that's correct on most inputs of size n, you can trans, um, transform that into a program that's correct on all inputs of size n. So let's do something called a bootstrap tester. I'm going to use that to test that the program is correct on most inputs of size 2n. Okay, how are we going to do that? We're going to pick random inputs of size 2n, and we're going to write multiplication in terms of multiplication on inputs of size n. Okay, so this is a linear time reduction with additions and shifts. Because A times B is just the lower order n bits of A times B plus the higher order n bits of A times B times two to the N. Okay, this is again, just a shift. I just write down zeros. And then there's an add. Okay. All right, so I use the program for these two, but these are n, n bit multiplications. And now I can use it to test two n bit multiplications. Okay, now, once I test the two and 
bit multiplications are mostly right, I can now use the self corrector on two n bit multiplications. So what we get is we can test size one, then self correct size one, use that to test size two, self correct size two, and keep going up at each point doubling. And after a log n phases, we get to size n. Okay, so that was actually the first idea in ELR. This was actually an algorithmic idea that was independently used by Edelman, Huang, and Compeller to check RSA, because you can do the same thing not just for multiplication, but also for modular exponentiation. And you can do the same, you can do ideas like this for matrix multiplication, division, all sorts of things. Okay, so this was an idea that could be used in many settings. Um, and in fact, it was later used by Nissan on the permanent problem. Um, because Beaver Feigenbaum showed that multivariate polynomials are randomly self-reducible, and the permanent is downward self-reducible, not by a factor of two, but by a factor of one. Like you can write the permanent on n by n matrices as a combination of permanents on n minus one by n minus one matrices. And he used that in, in, in his famous email that was a precursor to LFKN. It is not how LFKN works, but it was a precursor. Okay, so that is. Um, so we have a question on Zoom. Oh, okay. Is there a way to um, avoid the union bound in the multiplication self corrector? Okay, wait, I can't hear. Is there a way to avoid the union bound in the multiplication self corrector? Um, yes. Is there a way? Um, the, I believe there is, but I don't remember right now. I, the question is how much more complicated does it make the um the combination like here we just had to do plus and shifts um and i think if you're willing to do some error correcting and coding thing you can avoid the union bound um but then your self-corrector gets a little more complicated so it, it's sort of a trade-off um i'm sorry i'm looking i should look there but uh, <laughs> yeah yeah um but there, there are some i i guess offline i can answer that better because there are some places where that's been done with um some kind of coding theoretic ideas. Okay, cool. All right, so what we get from this, from this method is constant depth, total number of processors, order n for integer multiplication and n log n for modular multiplication. And notice that that actually gives you the little O property for sequential checker for integer multiplication because I believe that integer, okay, I checked this the other day. I don't know it's the fastest integer multiplication routine yet, but I think there's still at least n log n. It used to be n log n log log n log 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 n, but I think it's better than that now. Um, and so it's at least n log n, I think, still. Um, so it does give you a little more property for sequential, uh, but not for not as obviously for modular. And so I'm like, okay, for modular multiplication, can we do something better? Okay, um, can we get better than n log n? And then you know, I have to tell you, at the time, saving log n factors was like the lowest of the low. Everybody would, everybody would go around saying, I don't work on saving log n factors. <laughs> I say that these polynomials are exponentials. <laughs> and you're like, oh, and I'm, I'm just trying to save a log n factor. Luckily, I was in some good company because they were the MST people. They were trying to take, at the time, we didn't know how to do linear time and MST. This is before linear time MST. We didn't know how to do it. Um, and in fact, there's a famous um, quote attributed to Franco Preparata, at a program committee meeting, when somebody had submitted a paper on MST that was um, a little bit better than n log n, but super complicated. And Franco Preparata didn't, was not happy about this. And he's quoted as saying, take the log n, the extra log n factor and do it like a human being. <laughs> and that was a, the theory. Um, so I was a little nervous about this log n factor thing. I didn't want Franco on my tail. Um, and, and it was really the whole community. But I still had this idea that I wanted, I mean, I wanted to think about this idea. And this was the idea. Multiplication satisfies linearity. Sorry. And um, maybe you can do the linearity test on the program. Pick random x, y, test that p of x plus p of y equals p of x plus y. Seems like an idea. And in fact, later, when I was looking for jobs and I gave talks at places, I met real programmers because, you know, because um, the abstract said we're testing programs. So sometimes real programmers actually came to the talks. <laughs> um, and I actually met somebody that said, this is how he tested his matrix multiplication routine is he picked random matrices and test, you know, matrix multiplication is supposed to satisfy the distributive property. So let's check if it really does satisfy the distributive property 
on random inputs. Okay, so that so you would check pick random A, B, and C and check that A times B plus A times C is equal to A times B plus C for random matrices. So some, this is something that people actually did, but they didn't know if it was a good idea. And now um, we're going to, I mean, I'm not going to show the proof, but we're going to see that this actually, there's some justification for doing something like this. Okay, obviously this is not enough, okay, because let's say for integer multiplication, if your program always outputs zero, it's going to say it's going to satisfy the linearity test right any linear function will satisfy the linearity test so if we pick random x y and so okay so we need to check after you do the linearity test and you prove that passing the linearity test means that you're close to a linear function you still have to check that it's the right linear function and that's much easier typically so in this particular case of integer multiplication it's easy to see that all you have to check is that neighbors differ by b that x, p of x and p of x plus one differs by b um, for most x. And that would be enough. You can show that that's enough. Okay, so here's our proposed linearity test. And we did not approve this. Um, we didn't know about theory coefficients. We didn't know anything. So what was the first idea? Let's define the distribution capital D. And it's defined as follows. Pick a random z and output p of z. Okay, so I think for... This all works over integers too, but maybe it's easiest to think of Z coming from, let's think of the domain being a finite group, okay? And even get, let me just call it, just to make things really easy, let's make it a cyclic group, so it's even abelian and we don't have to worry about these things, okay? So we're picking a random Z and we output P of Z. It's a distribution, okay? Now, what is the right-hand side of this test doing? It's picking X and Y randomly. X and Y are random from the group. So X plus Y is also random in this finite group. So actually the right-hand side is distributed according to D. The left-hand side is actually not exactly according to D because P of X is distributed according to D and P of Y is distributed according to D. So it's actually, the left-hand side is distributed according to the self-convolution of D. Okay, so the self-convolution is just the distribution on sums. Um, two, you know, pick two elements, um, pick two elements from D according to D and add them together. That's D convolved with D. Okay. Now notice that if I pass this test, it can only happen if D is close in L1 distance to D convolved with D. That can, that has to happen. It might, you know, that might not tell us anything, but that has to be true. All right. Well, when is D equal to D convolved with D? Okay, so this is something that was treated in a text by Diaconus, I think on the first page of one of his books. And it turns out we know exactly which distributions are equal to their self-convolutions. In fact, it depends on the domain, but if it's an infinite cyclic group, then D has to put all of its probability on zero. So this is known. It's actually, this is easy to see. And over a finite cyclic group, it has to be that D is uniform over some subgroup of the cyclic group. Okay, so this is stuff that's known. Now we're saying, we only know that D is close to D convolved with D. So how much does this change? And the answer is not too much, actually. If D is close to D convolved with D, you can show that D has to, in the infinite case, has to put almost all its probability on zero. Maybe not all, but almost all. And it, in over a finite cyclic group, it has to be close to uniform over some subgroup. Okay, and this was the starting proof point for the original proof of the linearity test in BLR, and it was based on a combinatorial argument, and you probably haven't seen it, and you probably won't, because I lost it. <laughs> I have parts of it, but I, I do have parts of it, but um, I, I lost that. And the reason is here. Um, I had an IBM fellowship at the time, and at the time they used to take the IBM fellows and like fly us out to Yorktown, where we'd meet the theoreticians, or uh, we'd meet the people in our area, and in my case, it was theoreticians, um, at IBM Yorktown, and they had a super group um, with people, you know, they had really an amazing group at that point. It was one of the best places to be. Um, and Mitchell Benoit was visiting and he was on my schedule. And so he asked me this question that up until this point, I had been terrified to hear, like, what are you working on? Because I, I never had a good answer and I never thought anybody would be interested in anything I had to say. <laughs> so up until this point, I was like, oh man, I, I hate that question, but, this time I had, okay, I had a plan. <laughs> How am I gonna get around this question? So I'm gonna ask him, maybe he knows which D satisfied um, 
D is close to D convolved with D. Because I already knew from Diaconis's book what happens when D is equal to D convolved with D. But I didn't know if anybody knew about this D close to D convolved with D. I mean, we had proved something, but I didn't know. Maybe it's known, you know? All right, so he was really interested in this and he went to talk to Coppersmith. And then I got in the mail. Okay, I brought it. This is like, I brought this to show you guys. And I'm not even gonna let you touch it. <laughs> this is my handwritten note from Don Coppersmith. <laughs> <laughs> and he explains to me all his calculations about his Fourier analysis about D and D compiled with D. And he's done all these beautiful calculations. And this is up. Okay, so he figured that out. And then, not long later, I guess he learned how to use email. <laughs> because then I, oh, this is not the one. Oh, I brought you the wrong one. Okay, sorry. This is, that's not it. A, no, so not long after that, I got an email with a much simpler algebraic probabilistic method proof of the linearity test. Okay, so not just the distribution convolution thing, but also the linearity test. And it was much simpler than what we originally had. We had written down this long, long thing. And um, the, the one that I can't find, but um, it's, uh, we, and so we never put that in the paper. Um, what this is the proof that we wrote up with attribution in BLR. So what you see in BLR is actually Coppersmith's proof. Um, and it's an algebraic, you know, it's an, you know, Erdős probabilistic method type proof. It's really cool. Um, and it has a promise that we're going to write a uh, another paper, the Nora Coppersmith, Ruby and Rubenfeld, that is going to have the general case for arbitrary groups that are also not, a, not just cyclic, but also a, um, not necessarily um, commutative, you know. Um, so, you know, and that kind of took us 14 years, but we did write another, <laughs> we did it, we did it, but it took us 14 years to fulfill that promise. Um, and I want to say that this, um, this probabilistic method proof also inspired the low degree tester um, that later I worked on with um, Madhu Sudan. And um, is that it? Okay. All right. Um, so I think I'm not going to say much more about why convolutions of this distributions, but I do want to say that um, this notion of, of convolutions of distributions is a necessary thing for the linearity test to pass, but you can also show that it's directly related, but I'm not going to say any more about that. All right, so in general, what does this mean? But let's look at other problems where the for all statements can be replaced by for most statements. Um, low degree polynomials, these were used in MIP and PCP, and other people had other low degree polynomial tests. Um, Property testing, what else? Okay, so by this time I was doing a postdoc at Hebrew University and I asked Nati, are there other function families defined by for all statements? And he said, oh, there's this whole field of functional equations, go to the library. So I went to the library and there really is, there, really, there were two books. There were two books on functional equations and there's a whole bunch of examples. And there's these things that are called like addition theorems um, where you write f of x plus y in terms of f of x and f of y. And they're different. Um, so on the left, I have here the addition theorem, and on the right, I have the solution to each addition theorem. Um, and there's also these things called addition subtraction. These are just a few examples. Um, these ones relate f of x plus y and f of x minus y, f of x, f of y, and they have solutions too. Some of these do. But there's much, much more, and I'm going to get into that in a second. Um, but in general, the theory of functional equations says, given a set of functional equations, what family of functions satisfy them? Okay, so I, um, and what did they do? They said, okay, they usually were written for all, and then there would be like x1, x2, and in our case, x3 of x3 equal to x1 plus x2. So it wasn't all d to the k, like it wasn't all collections of d to the k, but there was some subset. You know, in our case, x3 was always equal to x1 plus x2. Okay. And so maybe you'd have x4, which is equal to x1 minus x2, or whatever you did. Okay, so which functional equations are useful for self-correcting? Which one lead to get good testers? Which ones are robust in the sense that you can replace for all by for most? Um, and here's an example of something that's really not robust. F of x plus one equals F of x plus one. The solution is all functions F, such that F of x equals x plus some constant. And you can see that if you test this at most x's, well, good programs will always pass, but bad programs will all, could also pass because you might have the function, like just take the first half of the domain and label it according to x, okay? And then the second half of the domain, have it be x plus 100. 
Okay, and if you didn't pick that breakpoint where you switched from x to x plus 100, you didn't pick that as your x value, you would never see that this is not satisfying this property. Okay, so there's one place where you don't satisfy the property, and now because of that, your function is really far from being one of the solutions in this class. So this is not a robust functional equation. And in fact, you can show that anytime you have a functional equation that's defined by linear functions of X, the tester is gonna be bad. And you can use, there's this theorem of Maria Clauer that shows that graphs that are defined by linear functions are not expanders. And you can use this to construct examples that will pass the test, but are really far from any solution. Okay, why is this interesting? There was this paper by somebody named Cody um, that he used this weird equation to test the real gamma function. Um, and this equation, um, as you see, has um, it's relating p at two of x, at two times x and p at x and p at x plus a half. Okay, and it looked complicated enough that it should work, but actually you can show that it doesn't using Clauer's result. Okay, all right. So um, I'm just going to say this notion of um, functional equations extends also. There's a work by Ravi Kumar and Shiva Kumar. Um, using linear recurrences to test. Now you'd say that's all linear functions, but they actually didn't use it, the test to be test for random n, f of n is equal to that linear recurrence. They came up with a different way of testing it um, based on that equation though. And this is great because this happens to capture discretizations of second order differential equations and feedback control systems. Okay, so it's still open what other functional equations are robust. And there's much more on testing, polynomial degree testing, locally testable codes, improved linearity tests, all of property testing, you know, then came combinatorial property testing, graphs, lists, everything, functions, all kinds of great things. Okay. I think I'm kind of out of time. I still have half the talk left, but <laughs> can I take five more minutes? Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. All right. So I'm going to test it. Okay. So I want to talk about testing with approver or how to safely use outsourced computations. And this is work with Funda Ergon and Ravi Kumar. Um, and in the following, I have to apologize, we're gonna use all these prover models. I'm gonna mix the models, sometimes there's a prover, sometimes a proof, and sometimes they're both in the same protocol. I'm not even gonna worry about the size of the proof, so all the things you guys are used to worrying about, um, I'm not going to. But I just wanted to, to give some examples. Like, let's say I'm trying to prove to somebody that my website is super popular, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna list all the hits I had in the last 24 hours. You know, and I write it down and somebody, you know, how could I cheat? I could put in fake entries or I could put in duplicates. So if somebody has a way to check that a specific entry is fake, they could just, you know, randomly sample, check that those randomly sampled entries are not fake. So that's something that maybe could be done. Um, and ensuring a few duplicates, thanks Mike for showing up, because there's this really, <laughs> There's this really cool, you know, how do you prove that there's no duplicates? If I didn't have the help of the prover, I'd need something like root end samples to find the duplicates. But I have, I have the prover help here. And there's this beautiful um, protocol due to Goldwasser and Sipser, which shows how to prove a lower bound on a set size. And you can use that in this case. Okay, so this is an example of how to use um, Goldwasser Sipser to prove that I have large website hit rates. Why is that interesting? Well. Let's, let's see another example. Let's say I have a huge graph and I want to know, does it have a large cut? And I outsource this to some program and the program says, yes, it does have a large cut. I found a cut of size at least K, pay me. Okay, why should I believe you? Why should I give you the money? Well, here's a proof that you can check in, and you can check this proof in constant time that there really is a cut of size at least K. And what I'm going to write down for this proof is for each node, we're going to write its color. Like, is it on the left, the red side or the blue side? And then we're gonna write a list of K edges crossing the cut. Okay, so this is kind of a, a pretty big proof. And now what the prover needs to do is pick random, pick random entries in these set of edges and see, do they really cross the cut? So 42, 47, let's see, what's the color of 42? What's the color of 47? If they're different, it crosses the cut. So I can check that most entries are legal, but I need to check that most entries are distinct too, that they're not just repeating the same edge several times. And this is where I use gold roster sipser again. Okay, so if the cut is size k, that b is always going to pass. But if the cut size is less than one minus epsilon k, then either I have a lot of illegal entries or I have a lot of duplicates, and one of the two tests would check it. Okay, I'm going to skip the rest, but 
things get a little even more interesting when you're trying to give a proof of like bin packing problems. Um, let's just skip that. Constraint satisfaction, packing problems, scent maintenance, and various property testing problems. So there's a bunch of things that we can do and a lot of things that we can't do. Okay, but I want to say that this was a very problem by problem. Everything I talked about up till now in this talk has been very problem by problem. Um, and maybe there were some general techniques that we could find. But there was after 2000, there was actually an effort that went into class based um, testers, one method for all functions in a complexity class. And so, in particular, in the checking domain, there were parallel checkers that were constant depth for everything in P by Goldwasser, Goodfriend, and Healy, Kaufman, and Rothfirm. And there were two papers on this. Um, where they delegate the work of a checker to an untrusted program. And there were interactive proofs and PCPs for muggles by Goldwasser, Kalai, and Rothblum, which was a landmark paper, and lots and lots more since then. Um, so I'm going to let other people talk about that. Um, and there were lots of other models of testing with approval and more on self-correction. We're just going to skip that. But then at some point in the late 90s, I realized, does anybody actually care about program correctness? Hmm. <laughs> Besides Martin. Okay. <laughs> Do you care about it? No. Actually, no. So I didn't ask. I don't have time. That's a complicated <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll tell you why I asked this question. So let me tell you why. I had a son make microsystem. I had a son um, microsystem. What do you call it? A, a pop. I had a. The computer on my desk was a son like. Um, workstation. Workstation. That's what I want to say. Not microsystem. I had a son workstation on my desk. It went down. Like the network went down maybe once every year and a half. Okay, this thing worked. You could rely on it. It was great. All of a sudden, my department decided we need to switch to Windows. And I like Windows now, okay? But at the time, the Windows machines went down every five minutes. But no, we had to have Windows because we had to have Photoshop and we have to have PowerPoint and we have to have this and we have to have that. And it's like, it was clear nobody cares about correctness. What they care about is functionality. Okay, so I was like, I think I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> and there was a grand repackaging. Everything from <laughs> program correctness, we switched and we called it sublinear time algorithms. <laughs> and we had the first workshop on sublinear time algorithms in the year 2000. And that's what I've been calling what I'm doing ever since. So I just uh, want to say, concluding remarks, typical advice to a grad student would be, you should work on the hard, important problems. You know, that's what you should do. And I want to say, well, you should. Sure, that's good advice. I'm not saying don't do that. But I'm just saying you can also just sort of bumble around and see if you find anything interesting. And sometimes this kind of can pay off too. Um, so that's what I want to say. And that's the end of my talk. And there's one more error. <laughs> that was the, uh, the uh, that's me back in the day. But <laughs> okay. okay, so that's, it. Um, we'll stay at it. Thank you. Thanks, Ronit, for the amazing talk. Uh, I'll stop the recording now.